stronger? Yes. Yes, absolutely. No, no question. The, the sort of an evolution of athletes. You know, I, I come from a little podunk town in North Carolina, and when I thought when I was playing high school football that the kids were big, and then I went back a few years later, and they were at least 20 or 30 pounds on average bigger than me, or, or than, than the players I played with. And I'm sure if I went back now, they'd probably be a couple of hundred pounds bigger, because that's been a long time ago. But yeah, there are some evolutionary sorts of things with diet and better lifestyles, et cetera, going on. But anyway. Um, so sort of part and parcel of what we just discussed was uh, with this rotational momentum is in how you transfer that momentum. And so this is where we start to see some distinguishing factors between the able-bodied athlete world and the, and the athlete with disability world. If I'm throwing a javelin, I'm going to hold that javelin, I'm going to back off, I'm going to run up to the line, I'm going to do all these gyrations, and I'm going to release it. But what if I have a spinal cord injury? I can't do that run up. I can't do all those lower body preparations. Maybe I can't turn my hips at all, but maybe I've got some rotation in my trunk and then out in my arm. So we have to consider then how we can transfer the energy that the muscles make through our musculoskeletal system to generate the kinds of momentum or velocity or whatever it is we need to ultimately perform well. So this is where coordination starts to come into play. So this is a combination of things like how strong you are, how well wired you are from a neuromuscular standpoint, how your nervous system communicates with your muscles to make all these things work. And so you might be incredibly strong, you might have great endurance, but you might not be wired very well. I had a good friend that I went to grad school with, and when he finished his grad work, he went on to, to do golf swing analysis. He knew the physics of golf better than anybody I know moved down from Kentucky to Florida and lived on a golf course and played all the time. And I went down to see him and we went to the driving range and he was here and I was here and we were starting to hit balls and all of a sudden I heard something behind me, bing, ball hit the steel divider between us. And then I heard another one and I heard the club go woof and I heard John go, damn. And I didn't look. I knew John well. I didn't look. And I just kept hitting golf balls. And I kept hearing, bing, 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 and then bing. He couldn't hit a golf ball if his life depended on it. He swung 32 times before he hit the ball the first time. But he understood golf. <laughs> he could run a marathon. He could do triathlons. He could bench press 300 pounds. So he was clearly a very fit athletic individual but he had terrible wiring so think about your limitations whether it's a person with or without a disability think about what your limitations might be what are your is it strength is it endurance or is it your wiring and obviously with spinal cord injury etc wires get cut and that changes the way things happen and so what we have to do as coaches, athletes, and sports scientists is, is to find better ways or other ways to make it happen. And this is really what we're aiming for, how we can then take advantage of what we have available to us to transfer momentum through the body. So how do we transfer energy from our legs to our hips to our trunk to our shoulders to our elbows to our wrists to release the javelin or release the ball? And if, we're, if we've got a breakdown somewhere along the way, how can we then make up for that breakdown by the height of our chair or how we position ourselves in the chair or whatever to get the most out of what we can get from this rotational momentum perspective. But the bad side of that is obviously what we're doing is generating more and more motion or more and more energy. So that kinetic chain of events, that coordination that occurs is going to then lead to high force, high torque, high motion, high energy. And what's that going to then potentially lead to? Injury. So we've got sequential motion, we've got simultaneous motion. When you're doing really high velocity kinds of movements, like a lot of the throws or some of the sprints, that's more sequential. That means things happen in order, in sequence. So as this graph shows, hips, then trunk, and then arm. And so that means that one builds on the other. So if we're well coordinated, it all happens at exactly the right time. But if we're not well coordinated, maybe this one comes over here and that one goes over there and things are sort of out of sync. We can still throw the javelin, but it just doesn't fly as far as we'd like. So part of the training for throwing the javelin is trying to get your kinetic chain to work in better sync. 
But if on the other hand you're doing something like uh, a vertical jump or if you're doing a, a shot put, then the resistances are greater. The resistance offered to the body is greater because of the mass you're trying to move. You're also not going to be moving at as high a velocity because you're trying to move a bigger mass. So in that case, you need a lot of muscles working all at once. So you don't do it in sequence, you do it all at one time. So you try to find the best way to get as many muscle groups and as many joints of the body working at the same time as you possibly can. And if you're successful in that, then you're able to then generate a good performance. Now, comes the math part. F equals M times change in velocity divided by time. This is acceleration. How you change your velocity from when you start to when you finish and how much time it took you to change that velocity times your mass is force. So you might ask yourself in this performance, do I want to maximize, minimize, or optimize my movements? And so my students, when I was young and full of myself, I would, I would make them plug numbers in and do math problems all day, and they hated me, I'm sure. But that was a different age. I've mellowed. My students have changed, and I don't do that anymore. I'll give them a couple of problems so they understand the math, but I'll say, okay, you know enough about math, let's just play a game here. If I want that number to go up, if I need to create more force, what is available to me? So from a pure mathematical standpoint, forgetting reality, just from a mathematical standpoint, if I want that to go up, what do I need to do to this? Decrease. Okay, increase, decrease, increase is correct. If I want, let's just take this one together. If I want that one to go up, what do I need to do to this one? Up or down? Make it go up. So I can make it go up a couple of ways. I can make the change in velocity bigger, keeping the time the same, or I can keep the velocity change the same and make the time smaller. So I can make my velocity change in a shorter amount of time. That means a bigger acceleration. Now, let's go into the real world. I need to create more force on the starting line in the sprint. Can I make my mass go up or down once I'm there? I can spit all I want to and it's not going to really change my mass. Right? You're not going to start shedding clothes. You probably don't have many on to begin with. So there's not much you can do to change your mass. So what's your only opportunity to increase your force? Well, it's either to somehow change your velocity or somehow to change the time over which you're creating the force. If you're a, a baseball or a softball player playing second base and the ball gets hit to your left towards first base and you run over and catch it and you're getting ready to throw the ball to first base, does that first baseman want you to apply a lot of force to the throw? No. So you don't need to wind up and take a whole lot of time to, to, to generate a big velocity to throw the ball over there. So you've got to think about what really truly is available to you. What can you do once you get into the heat of the moment? So one thing I say to my students is, if you really need an athlete to improve by increasing their force, and you've got six months, you've got all kinds of things available to you. But once you're in the heat of battle, Unless they've been able to demonstrate that they could do it before, there's probably nothing you're going to be able to do in that moment to make a change occur. But maybe if it's a morning competition and there's a little technique change that you need to make before the afternoon competition or the next day competition, maybe there is something you can do from a technique perspective to change things. But by and large, sometimes this just simply takes training to be able to create more force. But what if you want to minimize force? What if you need less force? What do you want to do to mass? Decrease it. What do you want to do with acceleration? What do you want to do with time? Increase. So that's like landing. I had a, Jeff will remember this one. We were laboring in the lab with one of our master students. She wanted to study the forces of impact on the mats in dismounts and gymnastics. Now I know that's not a Paralympic sport, but you'll appreciate the story. So we created this big platform in the cement floor of the labs and we sunk it all down so the flat force platform was exactly level with the floor. We threw the mats on top. We put squares or rectangles over where that force platform was and we asked those girls that were in their 10 to 13 age range weighing about 80 to 100 pounds to do a dismount off the balance beam and to try to land in that square and sometimes they'd hit it and sometimes they'd miss. You know what the forces were? 
that the force platform measured underneath those thick foam, we were looking at different thicknesses of mat, under those, the thickest foam mat, what their vertical force was on landing. So they weighed 100 pounds. What do you think the force was? How much? So maybe three, four hundred pounds? Seven hundred to a thousand pounds. With the mat. Now imagine if we just played a joke and just pulled the mat out from under them one time. Imagine how much force would have been created. So here they are, you know, this high off the ground, doing a dismount. They got all that rotational stuff and then boom, they hit. I bet the forces would be 15, 20 times their body weight. I mean, that, that would be an injury occurring. Yeah, because it would be a big force that would happen very rapidly. The time here would be minuscule, so the acceleration would be through the roof. So even though we give them mats to land on, the forces might be 5 to 10 times their body weight, depending upon how they hit. On average, it was 7 times their body weight for the group of 5 or 6 girls that we had doing those dismounts. Now, I've never participated in gymnastics. I've never really paid a whole lot of attention to the practices, but I can only imagine that probably over the course of a couple of hour training session, they probably do a lot of landings, whether it's dismounts from balance beams or whether it's all sorts of other floor exercises, etc. That's why gymnastic gymnasts have such high incidences of lower body injury because it's big force and it happens very, very powerfully. So just apply that. Is that why they're so young also? Oh, absolutely. I mean, once they get to a, a certain age, once they start to, to blossom into women, their body mass starts to increase. They can't do the things that young girls... And that's the difference between the, the, the women's gymnastics world and the men's gymnastics world. Back in 1988, 84, I'm sorry, I was in grad school at the time at, at University of Kentucky, and that's when Mary Lou Retton and Bart Connor and all those guys dominated the Olympic Games. They didn't have any competition, but they were, and they were very good gymnasts, don't get me wrong. And so... I just remember watching them on TV, just sort of strutting around. I think, man, those guys are, gals are in great shape. And I got an opportunity to go with one of my colleagues at, at Kentucky to this big festival because he was involved with USA Gymnastics. And so we were going to get to do a, a big party with the, with the gymnastics team, and I'll never forget them come marching in. They were all about this tall. But they were marching in like they were big bodybuilders, you know. <clears throat> so I, that just really struck me as to how incredibly powerful and fit they were but they were small. But why do they need to be small? If they've got a lot of mass, it's hard to move that mass, but those are rotating athletes. So if they had Usain Bolt's height, six foot four, they wouldn't be able to do double somersaults because their rotational inertia is too large. That would be like trying to play golf and never being able to bend your elbows at all. You could hit the ball, but you wouldn't hit it very well. So it's sort of the, sort of the equivalent. So sometimes we need to maximize, sometimes we need to minimize forces depending upon the particular situation. Well, this is where I start throwing my students for a loop. I said, okay, I just gave you that equation, now change it. Because some activities, force is your primary concern. So in activities where you're striking something, like golf and tennis and, and activities such as that where force and impact can be a critical variable for success, there are other activities where force is important, but it's secondary to velocity. So velocity-related sports are the things like the throwing sports and the jumping sports and the running sports, where you need to go fast. So this is the same equation, but we just isolated a different variable over here. And so now it's force times time divided by mass plus initial velocity. And so if I tell you that what I need this athlete to do is to make that number go by double what more time, I need less mass. If I put the number to be less, I need this to go down, this to go down, this to go down, this to go down. So again, ask yourself how to apply to this particular sport activity or this particular situation. Sometimes you gotta train for a while to make it happen, sometimes you might be able to make some changes in the context of the sport. So go back to the second best and throwing the ball Base. Do you want to the to apply force to the ball? No, because it can come fast. The first base, the first base. Do you want to he can't shoot the ball, and he's because he so.
so Thank <laughs> you. 